Welcome everyone to Change Your Habits, Change Your Life for June. Um, while I wait to see if anybody uh, else comes on, um, this recording will be available in a replay link that you'll receive in an email when this when the session's over later today. And I just wanted to say this 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 program was I developed this program out of a need to um, have my clients have better outcomes with the programs that we did working together. Um, didn't mean the information wasn't valuable, but um, as we'll talk about in this whole presentation, it's it's critical that you do it for the right reasons and that you take on new challenges or um, new healthy habits for the right reasons. Um, and then, you know, work on them habitually in order to make sure that you, that they stick. So if you have a comment, a question or anything, you can put that in the chat. And, but for now, we're going to get started. And welcome again, everybody, um, to Change Your Habits, Change Your Life for the month of June. All right. Let's just take a look quickly at this picture, the domino effect. I mean, if we, we talk about um, a reason why we want to change habits that are maybe bad and not beneficial and not um, serving us, um, we have to look at it like a domino effect, like perhaps that we um, need to stop the patterns of behavior. We're going to learn why that could be hard and challenging to do for most people. Um, but that's kind of the, I saw that picture and it kind of, I kind of identified with that as this program that we're, that we're going to be talking about today. All right. So have you ever felt super confident after learning something new? You say something like, okay, this is it. I'm going to do this. You were so excited about the new material and you just knew exactly. Maybe you saw the picture of a person, how you want to look, and you just knew you were going to do it. Only to get back into your daily routine and slowly slip back into your old habits without applying any of the new information that you learned. And I think we've all been there. And that's really, I mean, it's defeating, I guess. That would be the best way to put it. So what we're going to talk about today is why change is hard and ultimately then how we feel so defeated and maybe why we don't attempt again. Um, the conscious versus the subconscious brain or mind. And just so you know, I might use the word brain and mind interchangeably, meaning the same thing. And I also might use the word unconscious and subconscious interchangeably, meaning the same thing. The mechanism to break a habit. We're going to talk about how to change your default settings that are not serving you and finding your why. And number five there is actually the very first thing I talk about with my clients when I first start working with them, because as you'll learn as we go through this presentation, if you don't have a why, you that you kind of bounce all of those changes, those needed changes off of, you, it's very difficult to succeed. Okay, first a little bit about me. Uh, 41 years ago, our, I started in this, in this business, kind of looking like I did back there in 1988, but it was 1982. And um, I started off as a group fitness instructor, kind of at a little few years out of high school because I needed to start moving again. And I had a dance background from high school. So I thought hmm, I could choreograph a group class. If any of you remember the aerobics days, it was all about choreographing fun routines to music and all that stuff. And so I did that, began in 1982. And then um, a few years later, I started my business as a personal trainer. That was in 1986. I started off my business as personal workout system because that did define what I did. I was a personal trainer. Um, and at that time, back in the 80s, really literally every single person I started working with got healthier because they moved their bodies more. Even in my group fitness classes, I would say that was the big trend and it and it did make a difference in people's health. 
But also at that time, we had a much less tainted uh, food system. We had far fewer chemical exposures. I mean, even when we try not to expose ourselves to chemicals like eating organic foods, we can still be exposed to chemicals. It's really, really tough. And unfortunately, those things have taken a real toll on people's health. And I started to see what I understand now today, what was happening with clients, but I had no way to help them except to just keep them moving. And so um, maybe they were having pain. So what I did is through the years, um, I helped continue to help my clients get fit, but I also helped them recover from surgery and stay out of pain by ongoing my education and post rehab therapy and massage therapy. And those um, tools really, really worked, but there was more. There was a huge component missing. And back in 2011, I went back to school to fill that gap. And that gap, I got through my education and holistic lifestyle coaching and what I do today with my clients. Do I still help them move? Yes. But there's five other foundation health principles that I work with with my clients that are equally, if not sometimes more important, depending on where you're at in your in your health journey, um, where your health was lost, maybe where um, you're looking to go. So back then in 2011, I knew there were answers to the conditions that I was seeing my clients experience. But at the time, because of the way my education worked, they don't allow you to incorporate any kind of nutritional. Um, you can give a nutritional education. Um, I can say, here's what a vitamin is, here's what a mineral is, but I couldn't give other nutritional guidance to my clients. And that changed as I became a holistic lifestyle coach. And so today, everything I teach is based around balancing the nervous system. We do that. I'm going to show you a rock balance at the end of our session here. And we do that by balancing six foundation health principles. And I call them the six ways to wellness. More to come on that. So what happens in the cycle of either making change, failing at making change, whatever, we, we have a current habit. And maybe it serves us for a very long time, but all of a sudden, you know, our health is being challenged and get tired of feeling this way and we go, okay, time for change. I'm going to sign up for that XYZ program or I'm going to hire this coach to do that. And you learn a new skill and fire some new information. And by the way, when we are in that state, we are operating out of our conscious mind, not our unconscious mind. And you'll find out later how that, for the most part, is only about 5% of our brain usage in a day. Um, but you learn this new thing in your conscious mind. You're super excited to apply it, um, but maybe you kind of get overwhelmed or you're not sure how to start. Maybe you don't have a coach and someone to kind of keep you and guide you along the way. So confusion sets in. And, and when that happens, we revert back to our, our subconscious mind. Those old habits override and why does this happen? Why does this cycle? I mean, I'm sure many of you can feel that this has happened many times when you've attempted to make a change. So sometimes it literally is that you just get too much information that leads to confusion and you're kind of overwhelmed. You don't know where to start. But sometimes the information, you understand it fully. And but you you don't have a sustainable reason as to why you would want to apply those things. Like maybe you're not doing it for you. You're doing it for someone else. I'm going to lose 5, 10, 15, 50 pounds for my spouse to make them happier, to make my marriage better. And maybe if the ultimate goal is for you to make your marriage better because you want to feel better, that's a, a more, far more sustainable reason than having, it, having you do it for the other person. The greatest adherence to a change in habits or behavior is largely on how it aligns with your dreams and the dreams of the person trying to make the change. So in other words, are you doing it for you? Or are you doing it for someone else? And we're going to talk about why that number five in a real big way coming up here, but that's where it comes. We circle back around to why your why is so important. So that little suitcase he's carrying has all our hopes and dreams and for potential change 
and we're off. Time for some change. Okay, number one, why is change hard? Well, literally, it is the job of the body to adapt to our environment. As a matter of fact, what we learn from our parents, our siblings, up to age seven, and it can even go, it's up to age seven, but even as early as the final trimester in mama's belly, that was our environment programming us. That's creating our subconscious brain. The thing that, by the way, we operate out of 95% of the time, which you're going to find out here in a minute. So if we do nothing to change the environment, the chronic condition continues. Maybe it's not a chronic condition. It's a chronic belief system that makes for limiting beliefs, makes for you believing that you can't change. That's oftentimes the driver here. So how do we change the environment? So as I just said, 95% of our day, we're under the control of our subconscious mind. And so right now, think about everything you do that you barely have to put any effort into doing. Um, that even includes driving a car, which you're going to say, I didn't learn that at age seven. We're going to talk about habits in a minute, but habitually doing something long enough creates a new unconscious behavior. It's again, operating on the subconscious mind. Out of that 95%, 70% of those programs that we learn from early on in our lives are disempowering and self-sabotaging and create limiting beliefs. And largely because they were programs that you got from other people. Maybe you have the desire to travel around the world, but your mom and dad felt like Iowa was the only place to be, you know? Um, that's a silly example, but still somehow we have to find a way to break out of those habits, which is why you're here, right? So the desires and wishes that we have will come from that 5% of our day out of the conscious brain. Right now you're here today, you're learning, you're in that 5% mode, learning conscious behavior. And by the way, it is tough, even though this session only goes on for about 45 minutes maximum, to keep your attention for 45 minutes is tough and you'll fall out of that 5%. You're going to go, you're going to go into your unconscious brain. You know, something comes up, you want to check your phone or whatever else. Um, it, it's, it happens, but you will get a replay on this. So you'll be able to listen to it again. And every time you do, you're going to pick up something new, hopefully to what, until when you learn whatever it is, the mechanism that'll work for you to make change. Okay. So Again, the greater part of our day, 95% is controlled by programs that we got from other people. This means that as much as 70% of, of the program mind is potentially not fulfilling your desires and wishes. And could this be happening to you? I mean, maybe that's why you're here. Maybe you know it is. So number two, conscious versus subconscious or unconscious mind. Habits are the subconscious brain at work. Remember that cycle we first talked about, you come back around back to your habits when either you haven't found a, a mechanism to create um, that new change that you learned in your conscious brain to stick, um, the subconscious brain's gonna just take over. Now, it's not always a bad thing, brushing your teeth every day, remembering how to drive a car, I mean, Certain habits are very healthy and we're not looking to change those, right? We, we want to change the ones that don't serve us. And you can do that through consciousness. And it isn't something that simply is. It's something that we can control and point into a desired direction. Change will come when we are conscious about what we're doing. So let's talk about our thoughts. Where the mind goes, energy flows. Awareness is the greatest agent for change. Keep that one in your mind. We're going to refer back to that here in a minute. It's demonstrated again and again that thoughts affect neurotransmitters. So our neurotransmitters are like your serotonin, your dopamine, norepinephrine, um, whether they're feel good or stress hormones, one or the other, our neurotransmitters, excuse me. Um, 
your neurotransmitters are chemical messengers that will allow the brain to communicate with itself or different parts of um, the nervous system. So it, it creates, so literally a thought is going to send a chemical messenger to the, all the cells of your body and your body is going to react. Now this is new science and new biology where I've mostly studied this through Dawson Church and Bruce Lipton. And it's, but there's so many, so many people talking about it now. It's, um, it, it's, it's what science needs to understand, I believe, our healthcare system needs to understand this in order to get better outcomes. It's not gonna be about just taking another pill. It's gonna be about retraining our nervous system, retraining our thoughts. So every thought produces a chemical and this chemical affects 50 trillion cells in our body. I actually updated this slide recently. It used to say 30 trillion cells, but 50 trillion cells. The reason why these things can change is because with new science and new biology, the discoveries are happening every day. It's it's amazing. I It's hard to stay on top of it, but it, this, this subject matter has engrossed me and um, kept me looking for more information to study. So we have 810,000 new cells created every second in the body. So let's just get an example here. Let's go, let's start with this. Your gut, we have cell regeneration, cell turnover. And when that happens, cells die off, but new ones regenerate and go in their place. So think about this. Well, let, let me tell you this first. So your gut, you literally have a new gut, new cells in your gut every three to five days. Your liver regenerates in six to eight weeks, maybe five months. If you're talking about a liver transplant for the giver and the receiver, they can completely recover from that. This The liver will grow back. How amazing is that? As a matter of fact, regarding the liver too, as, in as little as a few days to weeks, healing can begin once you begin abstaining from alcohol. So if you find out that your liver is being damaged by alcohol and you're not too far down that path, then you actually can regenerate your, your liver um, and of course continue abstaining from alcohol. If that happens to be you, we all have different body chemistries and so it can affect people differently. Um, our skin every two to four weeks, our lungs every two to three weeks, our immune system every six months, maybe even in as little as three months, and our bones seven to 10 years. Quickly, I want to tell you a story about a friend who shared some information with me that she was visiting a doctor and was going to go on a, I won't say the name of the drug, for osteoporosis. She had early signs of oste osteoporosis. I just knew that would not be her path. And she has a great fear. She watched her father take a suitcase of medicine every day um, until he died. And she doesn't want that. And I told her this could potentially send her down a path, a rabbit hole of needing more drugs for different things because of what it would do to her body and gave her some research. And she came back to me in a couple of days and said, she canceled her doctor appointment. She's not gonna take the drug. And she's gonna look into some of that research I gave her um, in order to, it be, it, mainly because here's the big thing. We need to discover what might be wrong. Maybe it is a nutrient deficiency she has that needs to be addressed. You gotta get rid of what's making that nutrient deficiency occur. And maybe she has already, but she needs the supplements to get her back up. And once all that happens, I just said every seven to 10 years, it's even closer to seven, really. Um, we have a whole new skeletal system. So what do you think that means? I mean, you can reverse your osteoporosis is what that means. Our body is, is hugely amazing. And when we talk about immune system, just supporting that pretty much takes care of the entire cellular system. So when we are deliberate in our thoughts, which affect these cells. Now I just mentioned chemical things you can do, chemical, good chemical things you can do to your body to transform your cells. 
because we have cell turnover. But the other thing is thoughts. She could have continued on that path thinking she was doomed to have to take a pill for the rest of her life now in order to maintain what they say, maintain or have less bone loss for the rest of her life, which is a fear-based thought that does not create positive energy in the body. So if we are deliberate in our thoughts, our new cells are formed with the new positive energy. I gave her hope. I gave her research and hope and there's work we can do together, um, but she, she's probably gonna figure this one out on her own. And so just imagine, okay, if 810,000 new cells are created every second in the body, after a few weeks, this turns into trillions of new cells being shaped with positive energy. How good is that? Okay, number three, mechanism for change. We wanna switch out of the unconscious, like subconscious brain and into the conscious brain in order to make change happen. That's gotta be numero uno, okay? And remember, we're only there 5% of the day. Um, that's on average. I'd say we can change that. It doesn't mean 5% is, is what we're doomed to. So here are some little silly ways that help trigger change. These are not, this can be habitual for sure, but if you just force yourself out of habit and put yourself into conscious, it gets you into practice to, you know, going back to that awareness is the greatest agent for change. Just making these little changes makes you aware. Okay. Number one, you could drive home a different route and be aware of what, of what you see. That puts you right in the present moment, right in the conscious brain. Another way, sit at a different spot at the dinner table. Have your whole family do it. It'd be really, really fun. And everybody at the same time, eat with their non-dominant hand. It's going to make you tune in to maybe learning how you first, I mean, you don't, I don't remember how I first learned to eat, but it's going to put you there as well as maybe savoring every bite because of the effort it takes to, to eat that way. Do you have to do your whole meal that way? No. And are these things silly? Yes. Maybe you'll never do them, but these are ideas in case you feel like I just need to, it's like almost like a slap in the face. It stops you cold from what you're doing and makes you go in a different direction. And then meditation with the mantra. Um, we're going to talk about your dream, your why, and all that coming up. And that can be your mantra. But just know people beat themselves up all the time because they say, I can't stick with the mantra. I can't stay there. Just know if you float away from your mantra, it's not a bad thing. You just be aware of it and you shift back to the mantra, the goal, whatever you're saying. But just know, like, let's say a trash truck goes by or your dog barks. Mine just did a minute ago. That's present moment. That's happening right now in this moment. And you can say, oh, the dog's barking. Oh, there's the trash truck. It sure is loud. And come right back to your mantra. So it's that's all still very present moment. Right? Another mechanism for change is repetition. This seems like the obvious one, right? And it is, but some people still fail to be able to do repetition. But that is, if you can find a way to repeat your new learned behavior, that awareness, greatest agent for change, puts you in the conscious brain, that this could be huge, okay? You're gonna repeat that until it becomes a new habit. It sounds really simple. Um, but just know that your subconscious brain is going to interfere the whole time. So you just have to be aware. Put up post-it notes, find a way. Pings on your phone, something like that. But repetition is a huge successful mechanism. I mean, it's only going to be repetition where you actually create a new neural pathway, which is a new habit. And um, so repetition. And here's something fun as a mechanism. It's called The Five Second Rule. It's a book written by Mel Robbins, who has been kind of out there on social media because he made a real big comeback. But this um, five second rule is counting backwards, five, four, three, two, one, to change an impulse. And the moment you have an instinct to act on a goal, you must five, four, three, two, one, and physically move or your brain will stop you. So. She came up with this and then ultimately wrote a book about it, did the research and everything. But 
she was at a bad place in her life. She had lost her job. Her husband's business was failing and she was having a hard time getting out of bed every day. Um, she went to bed every night thinking, I'm, you know, when that alarm goes off, I'm going to jump out of bed. I'm going to do it. I mean, I'm, it's going to be better tomorrow. But she was drinking too much. I mean, she was failing miserably. Those are her own words. She just was not in a good place. And it just by happened after, you know, weeks and weeks of this, she sees a NASA launch on TV, sees the countdown, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, and thought to herself, what would happen if I launched myself out of bed tomorrow morning? And for some reason, this time it worked, she remembered and only she shortened it to five, four, three, two, one. She launched herself out of bed and she's been doing it ever since. She needs to do it. She needs to continue to do it. And she even wrote a book about it. Um, I'm, you need to forgive her for her language, but here is um, her talking about uh, the five second alone. Why not just for one day, anytime now, you know what you should do, but you don't feel like it. Why don't you just count backwards and see what happens? Like NASA launches a rocket, five, four, three, two, one. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. Yeah. And I haven't looked back. I don't give a fuck how stupid you think this is. I want you to try it. I want you to share it with people because interrupting the patterns of thought and behavior that are holding you back and pushing yourself to take action or to think something different, it is the only way you are going to change. The single most positive and effective tool is the five second rule mm. because it is simple. You remember it and it immediately interrupts the negative and suicidal ideations that torture people. And speaking of suicide, we know of 111 people who have stopped themselves from taking their lives by five, four, three, two, one, asking for help. So how this works, the science behind it is, when you count backwards, it actually activates the prefrontal cortex of the brain. The prefrontal cortex helps uh, people set and achieve goals. So it's, in this particular case, she's saying physically move or your brain will stop it. So it this could have to do with the fact that the prefrontal cortex of the brain is situated in front of the motor cortex, which is your movement in the brain. The importance of this is with when it's activated and it communicates with other areas of the brain for response, which is in this case, it would be movement. That's how you actually reset the thought process. Um, example, um, you're trying to lose 10 pounds and you know there's piece of leftover birthday cake in the fridge. It's just calling out your name. And you go to the fridge and open the door and you just, you're ready to reach for it. And what you do instead is five, four, three, two, one, slam the refrigerator door, turn the other way and walk away. And according to her, it works every time. It launched her out of bed. It takes you on a different path, a different trajectory, a different mindset. It's something fun you can try. Um, it's not something I've used other than, well, I shouldn't say I have, I have used it. And it might be when I'm fasting, doing my intermittent fasting. And maybe I had a really active day, more workout than normal. And I'm thinking, God, I could really have something to eat. And I usually skip my dinners what I do and then have breakfast and lunch. Um, I just want that little snack. It's just going to be some nuts. It's going to be something good. But I Five, four, three, two, one, take some water instead. And usually the, the thing passes. So just, it's a fun thing. You can give it a try. Um, her book is out. You can get the book and read more on it. I actually listened to it on audio, on, on audio book. Um, first five chapters, you'll get the main idea of what she does. And there's a lot of um, testimonials in the book as well. And the more science about it. So, how to change your default settings. This has a lot to do with language and how we talk to ourselves, how we say things. Yeah. Kind of similar to the 54321, you just, you gotta be aware. So you must not should. In other words, you need to stop shooting all over yourself. When we say things like I should or I need to, it keeps you where you're at. If you project into the, the present or the future, it 
propels you forward. So an example is, mm, I should clean that bathroom. I should call my mother-in-law. Does that ever happen when you say it that way? In other words, I'm I am I'm cleaning the bathroom. I am calling my mother-in-law. Means you pick up the phone and you dial it. So it, the language is what we need to be considered, considering and not shooting all over ourselves. But also when you say your desires and your wishes as if they've already happened, that's like the boot forward motion. We're gonna talk a little bit more on that in a minute, but you're saying something like, I am healthy. I am a writer. I am wealthy. I am helping many. I am rather than I should. And you'll say your mantra, your desire, your wish, your dream when you're in the right brain state. Our subconscious mind is programmed in theta. If some of you saw my promotion, I talked a lot about that. Theta is the brain state where, where our subconscious can be programmed. And that's when I first talked about this at the very beginning, up to age seven, whatever the baby also hears in the third trimester in the womb. Um, it could be smells and sounds and whatever, tastes from the mom, um, whatever they're taking in, but their brain is being programmed from that state up to age seven. And this is the primary brain state where our brain is first learning. So think about um, when you're a young child and some, a child learns you know, five languages, um, that's a positive thing for sure. But also if they're learning less positive behaviors from parents that don't serve them, whether it's food, nutrition, not sleeping, not moving, you know, those basic foundation principles that we need to follow in order to be healthy. But the way we um, access this today in our life as adults is just before falling asleep or just upon waking up in the morning, we can access our theta brain. And this might be your default setting change that might get you because you can do this habitually, repetitiously, to for change to create um, a, a new default setting for you. So, looking at the five brain states, we'll start from the bottom up. Gamma is the most recently discovered brain wave. It's definitely the conscious brain, but it's it is like the elite of elite. It's where we have total coherence. This is like the composer writing a masterpiece. Um, you know, when someone giving a speech is in that complete, it's a gamma phase, they, they are off the charts. Um, beta is learning, it's conscious brain, it's where we're at right now. You're in your 5% of your day learning. This is the conscious brain. Alpha comes between our sleep and our wake, um, or actually I should say between total learning and sleep. It's called calm consciousness. It links the subconscious and conscious brains together. And um, I don't have a lot of information on that, but again, do your own research to learn more. But today we're talking about theta. So going from the top down now, when we're asleep, that's our delta brain wave. Um, when we sleep, we're in total repair. It's deep sleep. Or subconscious. So there are dreams that can happen in addition to deep sleep. There's also REM sleep, but that's sleep and repair of the brain, by the way. But there is a point when we're falling asleep and a point when we're coming, going into, coming out of sleep before we get into alpha, that's called beta. This is imagination. It's it's equal to hypnosis. I guess it's where a hypnotist takes you when they put you under. It's subconscious. Um, there are recommendations that what you can do during this time, just falling asleep or waking up, that you could use earbuds and play a program that speaks to your desires and your wishes. Um, maybe you can even record one and repeat your mantra, repeat what your goal is, repeat your why. And that will help reprogram the programmed brain. Now, I, as a health coach, don't recommend any electronics in the room, especially when someone is working on their sleep and trying to regain their sleep. So 
Um, it, it, this might be the thing you do when you're coming out of sleep. It means you have to have your electronics, but maybe they're off and you turn them on, you get the program playing. This is up to you, but this is a tough one for me because I don't I don't believe in the electronics in terms of falling asleep because then you're falling asleep with this whatever EMF um, exposure to the brain while you're trying to fall asleep. So it's a tough one, but you know my belief is you could probably get into a, 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 a you know a hypnotic state even in your meditation throughout the day, but might be the reason why someone would meditate first thing in the morning before they're really engaging in any other thought thought process that could mean that you're still in theta um, and would help to reprogram your programmed brain. So do a little more research, but this has been fascinating to me and I'm probably gonna keep, continue to learn and continue to add to this program about this. Very critical. So final number five, finding your why. Hugely important. Um, the first thing I talk about with my clients, I want them to come up with a dream goal. I want everything that they do to support why they're doing it, uh, their, their big why in life. So if your goal is to be healthy, and that means you need to lose some weight, and you do that because you want to, you know, meet your grandchildren, let's just say, then you have to, all those temptations, those things that maybe are habitually what you habitually do and maybe even enjoy, you have to consider how that affects your why. And that's the big reason why people might turn into the conscious brain and say, and become aware and say, I'm going to support my why right now and say no to this. Again, five, four, three, two, one, support my why. So if we don't have that, we're not going to get very far with making change. Um, we need to know a deeper reason. And without a why, there's no motivation. We all need a dream goal to establish uh, any kind of permanent change. I can guarantee you can remember a time when something like that occurred in your life. And, and you're going to go back to that there was a really deep, really um, motivational why as to why. So here's your homework assignment, because this is huge. You're going to determine your why, your dreams, and your goals. And there'll be a reminder of this in the email that you'll get, but um, what is your why? What is it that makes you want to get out of bed every day? And is this for you or for someone else? My um, recommendation is it, it needs to be for you. What is your dream? Sometimes we lose sight of our dreams when we, um, and when we do, we our limiting beliefs start creeping in. But if we can think back to when we graduated high school or college, when we had huge dreams and ambitions, it's not too late to dream. And just remember, we almost didn't, there wasn't even a plan behind, especially out of high school. We just kind of did it. We had belief, our thoughts were positive, and it propelled us towards our dreams. And then what is your goal? I'd like to actually... Think of your whys and your dreams as kind of an umbrella over a goal, all a bunch of goals. You know, those little, you see on tack boards, you see those things. Hire a babysitter and there's the phone number and all those little strips. They cut the thing, you pull the little piece of paper off. I think of all the goals being those little strips of paper and that you, you know, you achieve these goals on your way to your, your dream goal. And you celebrate the milestones as you do that. If you have a hard time determining any of this, then you want to think about what your life would be like in two, five, or 10 years if you don't make a change. It can also be referred to as what is your greatest nightmare? And then you just turn 180 degrees the opposite direction, and there's your why. So there's your homework assignment. Putting this into practice, you're going to practice your dream goal as if it's happened once you determine that. And then use this as a mantra. For example, it's December, 2023, and I am the best version of me. Or today, I live a healthy life honoring the six ways to wellness. All your thoughts inspire actions. So remember that it bounces off that why, okay? All your actions and thoughts will be to support your dream goal. 
practice self-hypnosis by tapping into your theta brain waves as you fall asleep or as you wake up in the morning using a prayer or recorded message. Um, meditation. Um, and then repeat, 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 repeat your new learned skill or lesson until it becomes a habit. Change is absolutely possible and you can do it. Inch by inch, inch life's a cinch. Take it inch by inch, yard by yard, life is hard. The other day I was out in the garden. I had to cut away part of a plant that was dead and it's got all these sticks and different things. And it's really hard to determine which, so I have to go up the chute to see what's still alive. And I'm going, okay, I was telling myself inch by inch. I'm just, even if all I do is 10 of those stalks today, in the end, I'm going to have a beautiful plant and I will inch by inch, inch by inch my way there. So, um, and if you take it in two largest steps, it's really literally could be defeating. And that may be how you've tackled it before. So little steps are good. Little steps are good. Are there any questions? And I'm going to check the chat. Let's see. There's no chat questions. Um, I'm going to stop my share and say a couple of little announcements. Um, I'm gonna give you a link both here in this presentation and in your email for a discovery call. If you find that you need some help with this information or moving forward on any health program, we can talk about what I do and how I might be able to help you if we be a match to working together. But also I have June 26th through 30th, I have a free five-day summer sleep challenge. I'm promoting it now. I'll give a link also in the email for you to sign up for that. If sleep is a challenge, um, we're going to talk about all the, the, the reasons why you want sleep to be better and how we achieve that. So um, look for the email replay. And then uh, let's go back there real quick. And when we talk about sleep, for example, I'm gonna circle this rock right here on the inside. Imagine if that rock was gone, what would happen to this? Probably would fall this way. So yin and yang is the Chinese philosophy for balance. It's it's what westernized or westernized society calls homeostasis in the body. And we all need to have that. And by the way, let's say we have lack of hydration, which is over here. Our body will create a new homeostasis. It will too with lack of sleep. It just will that be to support the best health you can have? Probably not. And it's possible, just like I mentioned, how cells regenerate is possible to recover balance and homeostasis in your body without pills. And I teach that in my base camp group class. That's one of the, I, I have a group actually and a um, individual program. And that's one thing you can consider. Um, there we go, signing up for. Um, but to explain these three things, so we've got, it's what, this is what I call the six ways to wellness. When we have the dark side of the yin yang symbol, this is our yin side. It's the dark side of things. And it's balanced by the light of yang. This is yang. The white side is masculine. It's like daylight and it's balanced with the yin circle, the yin dot. So on our yin side, on the feminine side, we have nutrition, hydration, and sleep. These are the foundation principles where we accumulate energy, we recover, we rejuvenate. On the yang side, breathing, thinking, and moving. These are our, our masculine principles. Um, all of those can be very, also very healing and restorative, but they, actually require energy to um, for, for doing. So it's energy expending versus energy accumulating. That's one of the best examples to balance 
in the body. And so here is the link. You can screenshot this page for a discovery call. Um, and other than that, thank you for joining me today. I appreciate you being here. And uh, as you receive your email with the um, replay link, you can also ask me questions and, and, and reply directly in the email. So have a wonderful day. Hope you join me for my summer sleep challenge coming up June 26th through 30th. It's going to be great. 7 a.m. in the morning, about 30, 30 minutes every day to get you started. All right. We'll see you later. Thank you for joining. Bye-bye.